and blood his substance he took the form of man revealed the hidden plan the glorious mystery sacrifice of Calvary and now I know behalf of the Sims family, I want to thank you so much for coming today. We are here to worship God together and to celebrate and give thanks to God for the life of Charles Sims, a life in which we were all privileged to share. Uh, Christian funerals are always a strange mixture of emotions. Uh, Sheldon Van Auken called the death of a believer a severe mercy. And it is because, you know, on one hand, we grieve and we miss the one we love because they're no longer where they've always been. And yet at the same time, the death of a follower of Christ is also this cause for celebration, tremendous celebration, because we know today that Charles enjoys in full measure the peace and the deep joy of being in the very presence of the Christ that he was singing about just, just now. Uh, he's experiencing what every Christian lives for, hopes for, to see Jesus face to face and to be home forever. Uh, so to have times of laughter and times of tears right next to each other is entirely appropriate in days like this. Now, it seems senseless to the world around us, I'm sure, but it is the reality for the follower of Jesus because we live in two worlds. Uh, and because of that, we can have deep, genuine joy even in the midst of personal pain. And God is in them both. He's in them with us. He's here even today. So thank you for coming uh, to worship God and to honor Charles today. I did not know that I would hear my brother sing today. In the red hymnal, in front of you under your chair that you're sitting in is a hymn on page 440. If Charles were here to pray today, I believe this may be the prayer that he would pray. I didn't, I've never heard this hymn sung, didn't even know it existed until a couple of years ago. But if you'd like to follow along, now there's gonna be two verses 
that the Free Methodist Church is left out for some reason. <laughs> so I've got a Methodist hymnal, so we'll do number one. And then two and three will be something you'll just hear, but I can't, I can't omit them because they're, they're the essence of this prayer. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely shed for me. Here's the next two that you probably do not have. A heart resigned, submissive, meek, my great Redeemer's throne, where only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone. A humble, lowly, contrite heart, believing true and clean, which neither life nor death can part from Christ who dwells within. A heart in every thought renewed and full of love divine, perfect and right and pure and good, a copy, Lord, of thine. Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while life shall last in our eternal home. We thank you, Father, for your word taught to Charles and Byron and Mary Kay and myself, first at our mother's knee. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Father, over time, Charles would affirm that you were his strength and his song, that you had become his salvation. You showed him what is good and what you require, to do justice, what is right, to love mercy and kindness, and to walk humbly with you, Father which Charles did by your grace. Any honor someone directed his way would soon find the response, God is good, or thank the Lord. He knew that he who glories must glory in the Lord. That you are the God who made him, that he did not make himself, that he was yours, a sheep of your pasture. Wherever Charles went, he was to you, the sweet aroma, the sweet fragrance of Christ. And we are most grateful for the work that you did in his life on earth that drew us all closer to you. We are here today, Father, feeling empty because of the separation that death brings yet full of thanksgiving for the life that we shared and the memories we will cherish and thankful that we can rest in the confidence that we have in the knowledge of your goodness. We enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. We are thankful to you and we bless your name for you are good, your mercy is everlasting and your truth endures to all generations. May the wind of your spirit catch the sails of our hearts this day and set our souls full sail to the place where we find oneness with you and with Christ, to the place where your comfort can comfort us as only you can, to the place where your peace that passes all understanding keeps our hearts and minds in Christ, to the place where we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our lives and that we will dwell in your house forever. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray to you, our holy, loving, merciful, and gracious Heavenly Father. Amen. Would you take that hymnal and turn to number 234? We're going to crown him with many crowns.
crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and tell him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. No angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wandering eye at mysteries so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose Good afternoon. My name is Tom Howard, and I'm married to Karen, Charles's daughter. And so, if you know Dad, if you know Charles well, he's a very humble man, and I dare say he wouldn't want a big fuss made about all this. So would you permit me to explain to you why I loved him? The first thing I'd like to say are words that he's already heard from Christ himself. Well done good and faithful servant. He lived a good life. And if there's anything about him that we know for sure is that he was very faithful. And my, was he a servant. He had a servant's heart. If I can just share with you a few things that I'll always remember about Dad. The first time I met him was almost 40 years ago. Karen and I were sort of developing a friendship, and I decided to attend church with her. I, mean, I don't remember if she invited me or if I just invited myself. Uh, but as long as I was there, she said, you ought to just sing in the choir. And so I showed up in the choir room, and uh, we got the hymnals and worship music all lined up, and we went out there at the Wilmore United Methodist Church, and I sat down next to a gentleman. I had no idea who he was. And then we started singing. And I tried not to turn my head and stare. <laughs> I think I looked sideways. Who is that man? And I found out after service that it was Karen's dad. My, could he sing? I, I had no idea. So that's one thing I'll remember about him is his humble service. And I'll mention that a couple more times as we go. Uh, he had a very gentle spirit of forgiveness. There was no judgment. What I, I've known him for 40 years. I've never heard him say a harsh word of judgment to anyone or about anyone. Never. 
I think part of that might have been born out of his empathy. He was, a, he was an empath. He was an empathetic person. And uh, I still remember one time he, he and mom went down to Mouth of Wilson, Virginia. There's only one reason to go there. <laughs> Stephen and Lisa and the kids were there. And uh, dad took in a practice while he was there. And when he got back, I said, dad, how did you enjoy watching practice? He said, well, it was great. But those poor boys. Dad, what are you talking about? Those poor boys. I said, Dad, what's wrong? He says, I've never seen boys worked that hard in a practice. That was almost unhuman. I said, Dad, that's why they go there. They go there because Coach Stephen pushes them to be more than they ever thought they could be. And he just said, well, those poor boys. <laughs> Uh, so I could appreciate that. Even just this last week when dad was, was very ill and we were going to take him to the hospital to get oxygen and, and, and Karen mentioned him, dad, I'm not feeling very well going to see the doctor and see a few things. And he just grabbed her arm and said, oh, I'm so sorry. That, that's just who he was. He was very empathetic. Um, I'll remember his stacks. He had stacks around the house, papers, books. Um, I think they might have drove mom a little bit crazy, but I'm a bit of a stack guy myself, so I got him and never troubled me at all, and uh, I'm not sure I ever solved the stack organization. He may have taken that to glory with him. As we go through, uh, we'll get that sorted out, I'm sure. When I think of dad, I'll think of his stewardship, and he took care of everything. He was a, such a caregiver. Um, I think of the way he cared for his voice. That was his instrument. That was his ministry. He cared for that. And uh, I can remember when Karen and I were dating, and I, I would get invited up to the house on occasion, and uh, I'd hear him in the back vocalizing, practicing, rehearsing, keeping his voice in good shape, cup of warm tea with some honey in it. It was always about keeping his voice finely tuned but he took care of everything else, too. He took care of his tools. He took care of his cars. He babied his cars. He took care of his things. And I said to Nathan the other day, Dad was this fascinating combination of frugality and, well, um, generosity. I don't know any other way to put it. He was very generous and very frugal. And that's an interesting combination, but he pulled it off. Um, he took care of things. And then the, the other thing I'll remember about Dad are his words of encouragement. He always had a word of encouragement. I got an email from a friend this week from years ago. We, we taught together at Southfield Christian School, and it's been 20 years since we worked together. But I got an email from him. He says, the thing I remember about Karen's dad was a warm greeting and a word of encouragement. He was always encouraging to me. Now, my friend Bill was just a random guy to Dad. But we, were, we worked together at that school, and he knew that Bill and I were close. And he had heard a lot about Bill, but he always had a word of encouragement to me and to others. There were a few things that Dad enjoyed. Uh, he enjoyed nature. He loved visiting Colorado. He loved going to Big Twin. Uh, he loved plants and flowers and birds, and his, his yard is planted with flowering trees. And when I mow, we work around all those beautiful trees, and I'm glad they're there, but, but he loved his flowering trees and his flowers and his plants, and he loved birds. I still remember when he got so excited that a bluebird had showed up in their backyard in Wilmar, and I thought, oh, bluebird, okay. And then I saw that bird. My goodness, are they beautiful, and I, I get it. And so uh, he loved those kinds of things. He loved reading. He read voraciously in a wide variety of things, from Thomas Merton to Louis L'Amour. Uh, he, gr he grew to love Arizona, and he began reading Tony Hillerman. He loved the Tony Hillerman mysteries. And so he loved to read, and he, that's something that he enjoyed. Uh, he loved desserts. He was a pie guy. We just talked about this last week. I said, well, fruit pies or cream pies? Any kind of pie. <laughs> Chocolate pie, cream pie, cherry, you name it. And so I think of all these things that he just took delight in and enjoyed in life. He loved sports. I say loved. He liked sports. He followed his wildcats, and he would tell me he could remember his days as a boy uh, when they listened on the radio to the wildcats led by the baron of the bluegrass. 
he could reach back that far in his memory. And he loved the Cubs. He was a Cubs fan somehow. And he could remember uh, going up to Cincinnati to see the Cubs play the Reds. And I suppose he was rooting for the wrong team in Cincinnati. <laughs> but he always kept his Cubs hat. And I can't remember if any of the pictures up there uh, showed him in his Cubs hat, but he, he liked the Cubs. And this last one I'll mention, and I, I'm not sure where it fits in, but he rooted for the Buckeyes. <laughs> now, you probably learned that he got a degree from the University of Michigan. And so there's some cognitive dissonance here. But you know, this comes back to his empathy. Mom loves her Buckeyes. And when the Buckeyes win, mom is, and I think just dad wanting mom to be happy, um, he started rooting for the Buckeyes. And so that, that's the kind of heart he had and that's the kind of empathy he had. And uh, so I think of all those things that he took delight in. I think most of all, he took delight in his family, anything related to family. He loved things that his children did. He loved Nathan's dramas, both performing and directing. In recent years, we've been going up to OSU to see his productions there. And I know mom and dad loved going up there, and dad especially was very proud of Nathan's work there. Um, he's always been so proud of Kristen's art and the things that she does and the ways that she ministers at her church. He coached Karen and Laura Lee singing, and he took delight in the way they use their voices in ministry. I remember a story, I asked Karen about it this morning, but I, you know, she was, I think, a sophomore in high school, and she decided to go out for the, for the school musical. It was Carousel. And uh, she said, Mom, say, well, you know, not everybody makes the musical, so, you know, you should go try out and kind of see how everything plays out, but, you know, I mean, you may not be in. And Karen said, well, I just want to be in the chorus. I mean, that's all I'm doing and so she went she sang for them and she got called back I'm not sure if she knew what that meant or not she probably did but I don't know and so wow that's great she got called back and then she came home and told her parents that she was going to be Nettie Fowler and I'm still not sure if she fully understood what that meant in that moment but it, dad knew that that means that she stands in the middle of the stage and sings you'll never walk alone and he said we better get to work <laughs> And he had never heard her voice, her beautiful voice before. They had never heard her sing. And so he began coaching both her and Laura Lee. And they have such beautiful voices. I know he was so proud of them. So that was kind of a fun surprise, I think, for them. And uh, dad was a very humble man. But in some ways, he was very proud. But I dare say he was proud of the right things. He was proud of his students. He was proud of his children, his, his you know, and his grandchildren, he came to, to basketball games and soccer games, and he and mom would come, and they were so proud of them. He came to, to see Ian in Beauty and the Beast. He was so proud of that. He took delight in cars. I mentioned that earlier. But I will say he was very fickle. Dad was known to buy a new car, and within two to three weeks, he was still back on the lots looking, seeing what else is out there. And I, I don't know. It was just... I think the fun was in the hunt, You're shopping, seeing what's out there. I do remember one year, though, he came up to Southfield to visit us in the Detroit area, and it happened to be the weekend of the Woodward Dream Cruise. If you've never heard of that, the Woodward Dream Cruise is something that happens late every summer, and everybody gathers in Detroit on Woodward Avenue, and it's the classic American muscle cars going all the way back. And we walked down there, it was just a few blocks from our house, we walked to Woodward Avenue from our house, and he started seeing those cars, and his eyes got big. And uh, it's all American muscle cars, but every once in a while he'd say, that's the Volvo that we owned. I haven't seen one of those in 30 years. Or whatever it may be, and he just took delight in those cars, and you know how they park in the parking lots and open the hoods, and we walked up and down the rows, and he just took delight in those things. He was fascinated by that. And I did notice that from that point on, he seemed to time their visits to Southfield for that weekend. And I, my guess is that we gave him a heads up, and I told him which weekend to come, because we knew he took such delight in those things. But I want to tell you about the things that he really loved. Of course, you know he loved Christ. You heard in that song. You heard how his voice swelled when he sang, oh, how I love him.
the way he showed his love for Christ was in a, a servant's heart. He served Christ in ministry for his whole adult life. He served mom for years as a faithful caregiver to her. And when she faced physical challenges, he was there every step of the way, helping, supporting, encouraging. He loved his family, his children, his grandchildren, his spouses. His heart was full of love. He said to me on numerous occasions, my quiver is full. And I knew what that meant. Well, he loved to serve. Another thing he loved to serve, he sang, he led worship, he chose hymns in his music ministries, and he would always find out from the pastor, what's the sermon on Sunday? And he would pick perfect songs to complement those sermons. He was really good at that. I think he was a lexicon of hymns, Is there, if there's such a thing. He loved leading choirs. He loved mentoring students. There's another area where he was kind of proud. He was proud of his students. I still remember going to a Tigers ball game with him. We were sitting in the left field grandstand, and they introduced a man to sing the national anthem, and it was one of Dad's students. And so he made his way all the way around, and they saw each other, and they embraced. And just when a man sings the national anthem, and it's your student, and it's a surprise, you just go into a ball game minding your own business, and there's one of your students... That was kind of a neat moment to see dad delight in. Some of his students became professional singers in opera or on stage. Some of them are still in music ministry to this day, um, and serving in churches and serving in, in musical careers uh, and, and those things. Mom got a call from one of his students last week, and uh, I won't mention his name, but it was one of dad's students from way back when. And he told mom, you tell him he was my very best teacher, and you tell him that I love him. It says a lot. He loved to help others, even in music. These last few years, dad served in the choir at St. John's Episcopal, and of course, his voice isn't like what you just heard. But he still went back and he sang, and he had a buddy back there in the tenor section, and they worked things out together. His friend, not quite as musical as dad, appreciated the support. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was good. And, and our choir director, who is not trained in music, he's just a, a lay leader who is musical, but has no, no formal training. He approached me one Sunday during the coffee and donuts after service. And he said, nobody told me about Charles. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I did a Nexus Lexus search and nobody told me anything about all the solos and all the students and the careers and the recitals and I had no idea. And from that day forward, Doug would stop in the middle of rehearsal and he would often say, Charles, how should we do this? What should we do here? Dad only offered advice when, when he was asked. And he was otherwise happy to sit back in the back row with the other tenors and sing. But dad would say, I think we need to speed this up a little bit. Or I think we need to, whatever. If it was tempo, if it was mood, dad always had a feel for the music. And he was happy to be a consultant when asked. The one thing he loved more than anything was Christ. And so I want to finish with this. You know, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and tried to trick him, which law is most important? Jesus wasn't falling for that. And if I can paraphrase, Jesus said it's really quite simple. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor, the rest of those laws all take care of themselves. That's what Dad did. He loved God with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he loved others. And that love was shown in service, in empathy, and in help. And so in all these things, he modeled for us what Jesus wants us to be. And as a humble man, he would never hold himself up an example, but I will hold him up as an example for all of us. May we all be as faithful as this humble servant was in demonstrating Christ's love to our world around us.
number 51 there. That's another great prayer that we can sing together. Uh, 51. First scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Our second reading is Psalm 98, and we invite you to join us in a responsive reading of this psalm. It can be found on page uh, 426 in your pew Bibles. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> we ask that you'd rise, and I will lead on the, uh, the odd verses, and uh, we ask that you respond on the even verses. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The, the Lord, Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, burst into Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp, the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. 
Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, it's been good to be together. It's been wonderful to share together, and we're grateful for you being here. I'm honored and humbled to have been asked by our family to share in this service, and certainly it is a service of celebration. But I stand here on the shoulders of all those of us that so loved him. And to me, he was Uncle Chuck. He was Uncle Chuck. And uh, certainly all of us were so loved by him as well. I know he was Dr. Charles Kessler Sims. Uh, to some, and I met them, he was a son, um, a brother, an uncle, father, grandfather, teacher, choir director, a dear friend, devoted husband. The list could go on and on. You've heard it before already, and it's been great, the things that we've heard and shared, and they've been right on. But to me, again, the people that he journeyed with in life, he made a difference. He made a difference in their lives. He made a difference in my life. To me, he was always my very caring and loving and encouraging Uncle Chuck. He didn't seem to mind even when some of my children, they were very young at the time, they thought his name was Uncle Duck. <laughs> and so for, <laughs> it was like a year. Several of them called him Uncle Duck. I said, it's Chuck. No, it's Uncle Duck. <laughs> he loved it. He took it so very well, and he loved every one of them all the same. How he loved, as we've heard, how he loved. But dear ones, no matter what or who we knew him as or who he was to you, who he was to each of us, as we've heard, and it bears repeating, most important of all, he was a child of God. He truly was one who walked with God. 
And he lived for God, and he lived for others, just as Tom has said. See, Uncle Chuck loved God, again, with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he loved his family dearly, deeply. He loved others, whether it was students or friends or neighbors. The Heavenly Father gave him a love and gave him a compassion for others. But his love for the Lord, his love for his Lord and Savior, reigned supreme in his life. Now, you know he loved music, and he sang powerfully. Uncle Chuck would sing and lead choirs in such a remarkable way. He would get things out of them that they didn't know they could do and, and sing and share. Some of his children, my dearest cousins, they've said this, he never wanted to perform, never wanted to perform. He would have grieved deeply if what he was doing and sharing was ever viewed as just a performance. Uncle Chuck always, always wanted the music to represent his Lord Jesus and draw people deeper in their relationship with God. Many of us believe that he almost wanted to disappear as he sang so as to point all who were present to see only Jesus. This was because he did possess such humility. Made him a, as a powerful testimony of who God had made him to be. Uncle Chuck told me, as well as he told so many of you, how very often, I mean, he told me very often how very much he loved the Lord Jesus and what Jesus meant to him and how proud he was of me, how proud he was of my family, how proud he was of you all. He was an encourager. God gave him that gift as well. He told me how Christ in his heart and life gave him the power and the strength that he needed throughout his lifetime. You've got to know, dear ones, God was first in his life, close second. He was first. God was first. And that's the call of God for each of our lives. That's the call of God for each of our lives as well. Three weeks ago tomorrow, do you remember it? I hope you haven't forgotten. We celebrated Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And how thankful we are for that wonderful, remarkable reality. For today, without the resurrection, we would have no hope. But as Nathan read, death has been swallowed up in victory. Now, but today, we, and in these days, we grieve. We grieve much because we've loved much, loved much. But we do not grieve as those without hope. We are filled with hope today. We are filled with hope today. For Christ's resurrection establishes our resurrection. Because he lives, we shall also live. Someone has said, and I believe rightly so, the empty tomb was not open to let Jesus out. It was open to let us see that it is empty. Dear ones, we'll live again. We will live again. For there is life beyond the grave, and death of a Christian is not the end, but just the beginning. The true child of God moves from this life to the next. As you know, God created us for himself. He yearns to have an intimate relationship with each of us. He loves us. He loves you. He loves me. We're his handiwork, the highest, the highest order of his creation. And by accepting his saving grace personally, you and I can have the assurance that we will have abundant life in the here and now and know, we can know that we will live forever and ever in heaven. This is the gift of God, and it's received through faith in our Lord Jesus. That's the reality, and there's the hope. For you see, our hope is always in the Lord. Our hope in this life. And in the life to come, as we've shared together today, our hope is centered and anchored in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And in moments like this, we must certainly consider the reality that we each one must make our own decision to love and follow God and his purposes for our lives. I don't believe there's any question that Uncle Chuck would want more than anything for us at this time to hear about Jesus' love and grace 
and forgiveness and his plan for our lives. Your family, friends, Dr. Charles Kessler Sims has entered into life eternal for he was faithful to live out a life that was well pleasing to his heavenly father. A life that had faithfully and fully surrendered his all to God. And today we look to God. We look to the one who is faithful to give us that which we need each moment of each day, no matter what we face. That's his promise. He'll give you, he'll give me everything that we need pertaining to the living of this life and godliness. And he's the only one that's never broken a promise to you. The faithfulness of God, our Heavenly Father, has seen to it that we not only have what we need to live this life, but he's promised a home set aside for us in heaven and the world to come. That is a cause for celebration. That is a celebration. And we celebrate a faithful life today. A life faithful to his heavenly father. A life faithful to his family. A life faithful to you and to me. Faithful to all others. We each one truly are the better for having known and loved Charles Sims. And for having been known and loved by him. Before I pray, I just want to close with the final few sentences found in your bulletin or your program. It is so beautiful. It's a keepsake. It's a treasure. And this describes Uncle Chuck perfectly. This quiet man helped fill the lives of those around him with beautiful music. But his servant heart and steadfast love were even greater gifts. And without words or melody gave us a picture of the one he followed closely and he loved best of all. How we do thank God for the faithful life of Charles Kessler Sims. And dear ones, may we each one be found faithful in our lives as well. Please bow with me as we close in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together this day, a time for remembering, remembering a life well lived for you and for others. We praise and thank you, Lord Jesus, for Uncle Chuck and for the difference that he made in each of our lives and also in the world that you loved and gave yourself for. Father, we give you the, the glory and the honor for this choice servant of yours. And we pray that your comfort, your strength will be so very near to each family member and dear friend who's here. Thank you then your ultimate will and in your love you assure all Christians of a wonderful reunion in the world to come one day. One day, Lord Jesus. And until that day, Lord, please, Give us what we need to live out our lives in love and faithfulness to you and to others. We know you can, Lord, because we've witnessed this in Uncle Chuck's life, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And even today, we've got to pause and thank you for your joy and your peace, as Larry prayed. The joy and a peace and a comfort which the world cannot give and neither can it take away, nor can death. And so, our Father, uphold us with your love and grace. Guide us and protect us. Comfort and sustain us and stay near to us as we choose daily to stay near to you. Go with us now and keep us in the center of your will as we live out our lives for your glory and for the good of others. We pray this in Jesus' name, to whom be glory now and evermore. Amen. Oh.
Oh, <laughs> 